Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. I'm sure you can hear me perfectly well, can't you? Uh, if it's too loud, you can tell me. I, I might be able to do something about it. But I like it loud and clear. Uh, and I'm starting right away at 9 o'clock because I like, I've got a lot to say this morning. I've got to get it in. And the other thing, but what I'm going to do is start by one of the tiny stories. But this is sort of punishment for the people who arrive late. They won't hear the funny stories, right? <laughs> uh, one of the funny stories is on the sheet that has demonstrations in it, but right in the bottom right of the corner, there's two words, Kenny and I, in the top of the court row, uh, with the rhythms they have. And I want to tell you the simple little story about that. This story is about a former uh, student at University College who lived out in the suburbs, and he used to come in by uh, tube every morning. He was often to come late, I think, but not very often. Anyway, uh, he used to come in every morning, and he would go to the uh, ticket office where, out in the suburbs where he was, and he'd ask for a, a, a ticket to the nearest station to UCL, which as you know is top before the road, right? He'd ask for it, and every time he asked for it, they gave him a ticket instead to Kensington High Street. Right? <laughs> well, this was very dismayed for a man who was a student of phonetics. So he confessed this terrible happening to his uh, teacher. And uh, um, then the teacher said, well, say it exactly as you say it to these people. And he said, a ticket to Tottenham Court Road. Ah, so now there's only one central station on the tube system that has that rhythm. <laughs> and that is not Tottenham Court Road, which you're misdressing, but uh, Kensington High Street. So there's part of the model what I've come to talk about today. I'm talking chiefly about rhythm, right? Another example of a rhythm being a problem. I had a friend when I taught at the University of Tehran who was a lecturer in Indian studies, in Donoghue as he called it. And he spoke beautiful English, excellent, very clear, very uh, sophisticated. But one day he said to me, he began a sentence with, and of course I didn't understand that word. And I was thinking of what he said. He said, Burgoon. And I was wondering what in heaven's name he had said. So I don't remember the rest of the sentence he said. I kept wondering about it until after a little while I realized what, he, what he'd done wrong. He put the stress in the wrong place. Now he spoke quite fast, but if he hadn't... Uh, reduce the speed necessarily, or he hadn't got anything wrong other than the stress, then I would have understood him perfectly, but uh, for instance, if he'd said it with a fairly strong Indian accent, particularly, <laughs> then particularly it would have been perfectly recognizable to him. And while these latecomers are coming in, I'm going to tell you another little joke, right? <laughs> this is your bonus for coming early, okay? <laughs> right. And this is a, a joke that I've heard from a, a comedian on the on the radio. Uh, it's always stuck in my mind because it's such an excellent joke, because it has a moral, a, a real helpful purpose. Because it reminds you that one of the main things you have to do in studying spoken English is to listen very carefully to yourself all the time. In other words, to monitor yourself. And the joke is this. A woman went into a smart restaurant, sat down at a table by herself, and a, a, a smart waiter came over, you know, with a little uh, napkin over his arm, and said, good evening, madam, now what can I get you? And she looked at the menu and she said, well, first I'll have kidney soup. <coughs> um, I beg your pardon, madam, I believe you mean kidney soup. Is that right? She said, well, I said kidney, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> In other words, she wasn't monitoring her output, right? But she didn't get the end in the right place. Kidley did lie. Yeah. All right. <laughs> now I think I've given him enough time to come in and settle down and get on with the proper topic. Okay? And my proper topic is, well, actually, we're still on that proper topic, because the overall topic of this lecture is rhythm. Right? Now, why are weak kinds of contraction so important? Well, uh, we'll come on to that in a moment, but first thing, what is a weak form? And there's a definition of it. I very rarely see it satisfactorily defined. Uh, but it's a weak form uh, as a reduced form of a word with a different set of phonemes, <coughs> that phonologically different thing. It's not just shorter, quieter, softer, whatever it is, it's got different phonemes, which is of course a very fundamental thing in linguistic analysis. And there are 
40 or so words in English. Now, fortunately for you, thousands and thousands of words in English have uh, reduced form. Thousands of them have weak forms, right? But you can forget all about them, but all those weak forms in those other words are optional, but not in the 40 that we're going to talk about in this morning. The 40 or so this morning are not optional because if you depart from them, don't use them in the proper place, then you change the whole style of what you're saying and perhaps, the, perhaps in fact, the, the message completely. So uh, these words, the, the stylistically distinctive variants, they provide the grammatical structure of the sentences. And here we go on. Uh, I'm now going to demonstrate what it sounds like if you say a couple of sentences, quite ordinary sentences, without any weak points. Uh, you can see these are the sentences I've been saying, but it'll take more than an hour and a half for me to go into town to get the cash from our bank so they can have the money as quickly as possible. Tell us what they're asking us to give them at least, right? So that's what a normal native speaker would say. Now look at what happens to very many beginners, at least, in learning English. They say, but it will take more than an hour and a half for me to go into town to get the cash from our bank so that they can have some money as soon as possible, tell us what they are asking us to give them, give them uh, at the least. Now, that's uh, bizarre. I, mean, I admit it's an extreme option. Uh, fortunately, you don't uh, do anything quite as bad as that as a rule. But that's the kind of thing you take to do if you don't uh, include weak forms. So there's, there's, once again, transcribed for you the natural way of saying it. It doesn't take me more than an hour and a half for me to go into town to get the cash from our bank. So that they can have some money as quickly as possible. Tell us what they're asking us to give them at the, the least. That's what it should be like. Now, I'm going to give you some more examples to try and see my whole job now is I'm not going to teach you the English week form. I haven't got time to do that in, in this lecture. I've given you two sheets and one sheet contains a list of the week form words and all the contractions, all the common contractions. So you can start learning it from that when you're ready, right? But I'm not going to go through that with you. It would take too much time and it's very boring, right? So I'm going to take some examples of where misunderstandings can or have taken place for by failure to use weak forms. And the first one I have here, number one, is I'm giving him a painting that I shall have done by Christmas. Now that's one way of saying it. Now, the other way of saying it is this. I'm giving him a painting, oh, I, yes, I'm giving it should be. I'm giving him a painting that I shall have done by Christmas. And in fact, you probably, the majority of you here, didn't hear any difference between those two sentences. But to a native English speaker who is very sensitive to use of weak forms, he would be perfect here in his mind that on one of those sentences meant that the person speaking was the painter, and the other sentence, he, the other way of saying it, with the particular weak form, uh, with or without, uh, he'd be quite sure that the person wasn't doing the painting, the speaker wasn't the painter. Now, do you, when you ask yourself, have you any idea what it is? Where does the difference come? That's a question to ask. But where's the giveaway point in that sentence? Hmm? How many know that? Put your hand up if you think you know which word is the, is the uh, <coughs> difficult word there. Right. See one or two there anyway. Well, it is the word have. Because the word have can have two meanings. It can be what it is nine times out of ten, an auxiliary verb, right? Do is to conjugate a, a verb, do is to conjugate the word uh, do here, or done. Or it can be a causative verb, meaning I cause something to be done. And so if you say it's something I shall have done by Christmas, I'm having it done, I'm having somebody else do, not me. Or I shall have done, I'll do it myself. So that's one big misunderstanding you get. Now, the second one comes from that famous book, Intonation of Colloquial English by Common Arnold. And at one time I used to teach this book until I got rather tired of it. <laughs> and uh, uh, there are two, it, it's very well arranged that book, in that it always has an introductory remark and then another remark from another speaker which demonstrates uh, uh, the intonation that uh, they're paying attention to. 
Now the first remark then is these books are awful, right? right? And then follows, well, now I'm going to have to say it in two ways. Two of them are all right, or two of them are all right. Now two of them are all right is the one that needs the comma, right? Because the comma separates off two separate clauses, really. Two of them are all right means I agree with you that the books are awful. <coughs> in regard to two, perhaps he had not read. The person replying had not read uh, more than two. Or the other one is, two of them, uh, two of them are all right with no pause. See, the pa a pause at the comma is only potential. We normally wouldn't make a uh, We don't pause at every comma. Commas are used largely in, in written English to point out the grammar in sentence. So we don't necessarily uh, make any adjustment of our pace of speaking to include them. So how is the, well, how's the problem there? Well, if you say two of them are all right, I agree with you, two of them are, they are awful. The other one is two of them are all right, I disagree with you. I've read two of them and they're fine. Right? So total difference of meaning, just depending where the R ends its clause, <coughs> and end, uh, a weak form with ending its clause is usually too prominent to be weakened. Uh, but in, when all right is the complement, not a separate adverbial phrase, then uh, the weak form would, would be uh, the weak form would be used, but all right, right. Now this next example, I, I saw uh, Michael Ashby uh, give to a, a group the other day in the lecture, because you will notice that quite a bit of what we say naturally overlaps. Uh, <coughs> Professor Wells has talked about compression as well as me. We probably use different examples each time, and sometimes we may even use the same example. This is quite similar to one that uh, Michael Ashby used. I've known it for four weeks and he's known it for four months. Now, that is the way that the form without the numeral, with the word for, F-O-R, would be said by most beginners in, in learning English. Uh, and if that was said to a native English speaker, I've known it four weeks, but he's known it four months, they would take it to mean the numeral nine times out of ten, right? Because we never pronounce the, the word for when it's weakened, when it's any preposition or position in front of us. A noun, we never say it in that form form for, <coughs> unless we're stressing it, which would be very unusual. So that would be a misunderstanding, it's the perfect possible. And then there's another one. Uh, this, this is a, a children's uh, uh, riddle, if you like. Uh, when a cop's hungry, it goes back four seconds, right? Well. Uh, if you say it with the strong form, then it, it's the new It's the number of seconds it, it, it goes slow, right? But actually, to go back for seconds is a typical children's expression uh, when they have school dinners and everybody's been served once, then perhaps the, the people serving food will say, anybody wants seconds, anybody wants a second healthy, in other words. And so to go back for seconds, of course, is to go back and have some more more food. Okay. More? Yes, he's going too fast and he's going too fast, right? To fast, fast can be a verb meaning to abstain from food. And too fast, of course, can be at an excessive speed, exceeding the speed on the motorway or whatever it is. So that can, uh, if, if pronounced with the strong form, to will be interpreted as the adverb, T double O, instead of the weak form, T of the, uh, when they haven't written the on top of the preposition. The five prepositions, at, for, from, of, and to, all frequently have weak forms, typically have weak forms. Now, number six, I was 18 <coughs> months before I could walk. I was two. Now, if you say I was two and give the strong form of was, then uh, th that means it's a separate clause. I was. I also was 18 months before I could walk. Uh, but if you say I was two, then was is now uh, in weak form, and now it, it obviously the uh, word two is uh, connected with it in a different way. Uh, it, it now is the new one. I was two means I was two years old. I was more than 18 months. And by the way, uh, one of the things that that is <laughs> English idioms, if you like, one of the things we don't say in English is uh, a year and a half, right? We always say 18 months instead, normally. 
So anyway, there it is. Not a year and a half, but 18 months. It's one year, two years, and in between 18 months. Right. Now, uh, here's the one I think that Michael gave the other day. Which train are you taking? Well, or plane are you taking? If somebody says the 2210, right? Well, uh, using the weak meaning to say 2210, meaning 940, if he says 2210 when he means 940, it's in great danger of being misinterpreted as the 24 hour clock. 2210 means 10 past 10. So you could, you could miss a train over that. That basically is what I need for. And uh, my eighth example is uh, one coming back from uh, my experience that when I was a, a, on the staff of the University of Leeds, I taught a number of students from the Middle East, and one of them came in one morning and said that uh, he, his friend had offended their landlady uh, because she, he had asked, I said, well, what did he say? Well, he asked for bread and butter. And of course, the landlady thought that he, she, he was hinting, or perhaps even asserting, that she was giving him bread with no butter on it. He, in other words, she was so mean, put so little butter on, that it was uh, practically no butter there. So we had to say bread and butter. Now, he didn't actually stress the word and, probably, but if he said it in its strong form, it would sound virtually stressed. So it was no wonder she took offense, right? And the last little example is, there were a funny way we used the word that. When we don't like a person, uh, when we refer to a person we disapprove of or dislike, we often call him that John or that Michael or that Jack, you know. <laughs> so here we are. I said that John told them. Uh, this is means that, or, that one we all hate, you know. Uh, in other words, it's quite different from I suspect the John, the John, the relative. The relative, uh, it's a quick question of relative versus the demonstrative. There are two words that in English, T H A T, both spelled the same, of course. One that always, that always has schwa and is a, a relative. One that it always has a clear vowel a and it's a demonstrative. Okay. Finally, having I hope you see what my job to, I have to do today is not to teach you how to use the wing form, but to make you aware of the necessity of, of uh, using them so that you study them yourself, so you take account of them. Uh, and I found some students become very enthusiastic after I've uh, given a, a talk of this sort, and they, they try to use weak forms all the time on all sorts of words we don't have weak forms for. And, oh, we've got five prepositions to have weak forms. Right, they're going to make all the prepositions into weak forms. And they, they uh, make the word uh, on and the word in into weak forms. But we don't normally use a weak form on or in. And there are other words like that. Now, in this case, uh, there's the word sun. And uh, uh, I've heard a student say, Father, and I give him the sentence to, to read it out, Father's bringing home some missionary for dinner. Now, it's a very good thing to be aware that the word sun, when it's weak, and when in front of a word, it usually refers to a quantity, like some money, some sugar, and so on. Uh, when it's in that form, it, it doesn't even have any vowels, just sun, right? Uh, good, I think. Bear that in mind. But the word sum has two senses. In some cases, it means not just an amount of, but a particular one. A one that you don't know the name of, say, so you have to refer to some person, some uh, thing, whatever it is. So, what about this sentence then? Father's bringing home some missionary for dinner. But well, it could only have been uttered by a cannibal, couldn't it? Right? Because you've got an arm or a leg, a missionary is going into the boiling pot right? for dinner. So be careful about that sort of thing. You can create a rather sad effect. Now, what I'm going on to now is just the most ordinary kinds of sentences that anybody uh, can have to use constantly in everyday speech. And you'll see that they are things that people repeatedly get wrong. Uh, I'm going to just read these out for you now, but I can tell you this, that if I ask you round the class now to, to read them to me, uh, most of you get most of them wrong, many of them wrong. Uh, the ice is melting, what does that do? When am I expected? What have we got? Give them to them. How many people say give them to them? Instead of uh, replace that word, give them to them. It sounds absolutely terrible. Uh, like a machine speaking, you know? It sounds like one of these mechanical things that, that can't adjust to 
uh, your monument. When had he caught it? I should have spent it. That'll do. How many had he had? Had he had his hair cut? That sort of thing. Now, how many had he had is a very common sentence because it very often people who had a very nice evening drinking at the pub and one of their number perhaps had got rather the worse for wear, as we say, rather drunk, right? And then people talking about his condition last night will ask how many pints of beer had he drunk, right? And they say how many had he had. And I've hardly ever found any student of mine who hasn't had it pointed out to him that we would use weak forms in the way we do in that sentence hardly ever known them to get it right. It's extremely often got wrong. So there it is. Uh, I'm afraid some of my phonetic symptoms aren't coming out very well on this machine, but uh, uh, they look quite on mine, but there we are. Right. So that's uh, uh, weak form words. You've got a list of them there. There are uh, about 40, just over 40 of them. Uh, the last two on your list this is the back of the demonstrations paper. The last two on that list apply only to uh, British usage. Americans don't say Saint or Sir. They say Saint and Sir uh, instead. But all the others we tend to agree. In fact, this is one of the other important facts about the uh, weak form. It doesn't matter what accent of English you use. 99% of all native speakers of English will make these reductions very regular. Right? It's very, very few varieties of English that have fewer weak forms than the ones mentioned here. They may have extra ones. Uh, I can think of about one dialect of English that had, had a lot fewer weak forms, uh, relatively speaking, than the, the standard forms. Uh, ordinary American English and ordinary British English have this, practically the same thing. I mean, you can hear um, American politicians say, uh, give them, uh, instead of give them, right, sometimes. But uh, even most Americans don't do that. If you can hear it. in this cu country, uh, for a, a person to say give them to them would be absolutely uh, un unbelievable. So I'm going to uh, uh, tell you about uh, weak form compounds in a moment. But uh, there's your list of weak forms, and here's your list of contractions with them. I'm not going to go through the whole lot with you, anything like that, but you can see that if you look carefully at the two transcriptions, that uh, the contract, there's a normal uh, spelling and an informal spelling which gives you a clue to the fact that we don't normally say those, those words in that right-hand column in the way they are uh, a lot of the 34. In fact, an interesting statistic that I once worked out about this is that um, of these words, there are about 100 if you put these two lists together, there are about 100 or less. And of those, of the words we use in ordinary conversation, I went through a, a number of conversations of thousand or so more words, looking at what the occurrence of these words were, and I found that every fourth word was on that list, on those two lists. Every fourth word was either a weak form word or a contraction. So that's a huge quantity, 25% of all the words you ever use if you're carrying on an ordinary everyday conversation. So it makes them very worthwhile taking notice of. So there you are, the weak on compounds. And uh, I'll go on from there. Uh, well, I've given you that statistic here. And I'm going on now to talk about rhythm a bit more. And one of the effects, you see, of uh, not using the weak <coughs> that we properly do is that you don't go smoothly over the things we try to avoid stressing. And uh, you make your English too easily sound rattly. I call, I call the kind of speech you get in English pouncing. We go smoothly over the things that are unimportant and pounce heavily on the things we feel are important, the syllables we think need stressing. Uh, whereas some other languages, some to an extreme extent, languages like French and, and Spanish in particular, but, but most other languages are more in the rattling uh, side of things than, than English is. English is an extreme pouncing language. And if you rattle, then you sound well, I, I invented, invented one English sentence that does rattle by accident, if you like. Here it is. He deposited a packet of cricket tickets in his jacket ticket. 
That does not sound like a normal English speak. It's a very rare kind of sentence. So uh, he deposited a packet of British tickets in his jacket ticket pocket. Uh, it does sound like a gun being fired off a machine gun. Um, some other uh, mistakes that can occur and so on. Um, if you say, uh, don't take it too hard, and use the strong form of the word too, right, then you don't sound like an Englishman at all. You sound like an American saying, don't drink that tea too hot, you know, because American, Americans pronounce the word, well, in the English, the word hard, they say hard, meaning H-O-T, hot. So they, you sound, if you say, don't take it too hard, as if you're speaking American English, and talking about how hot something is, but don't take it to heart, is a sympathetic remark in British English, meaning don't get upset by it, don't, don't dwell on the idea. Uh, and another example, this again, is it, it's a, a writer of lyrics of songs making a joke out of our, our weak form system, our contracted form system. And this one, I, I have to sing to you, I suppose. It's, I'm biding my time, because that's the kind of guy I'm. Now, nobody would say that's the kind of guy I'm. They have to say the kind of guy I am, right? But of course, the joke is that he gets a rhyme out of it by distorting the language. And of course, one of the funny things I've heard is I've heard a, a particular singer that would be a recording of this, and he loses the rhyme. He ignores the joke and says, because that's the kind of guy I am. Well, that's not what Ira Gershwin intended on that occasion. He was uh, producing a, what we call an outrageous rhyme. <coughs> okay, well, I think that's about all I really need to do directly on the subject of um, uh, weak forms and contractions. And now I'm going to use the rest of the time I've got to demonstrate to you uh, some of the features of English and what they contribute. So first of all then, uh, we can ask ourselves various questions, and I'm not sure the answer to some of these questions, but how important is intonation, for instance, right? Now, I think intonation is very badly taught in most places, uh, very inadequately dealt with, if not forgotten altogether. Fortunately, on this course, a good deal of attention is paid to it, uh, not with an ideal uh, system of analysis of it, but with um, one that nobody's found a better one for yet. We'll be eagerly looking forward to this new book by <coughs> Professor Wells <coughs> on the intonation, see if he's improved on the common round system in some way. But anyway, <coughs> I'm going to uh, ask you to uh, listen to me reading uh, from uh, some texts. And the first one I'm going to choose is, I'm going to say completely normal English in every other way, except that I am using uh, no intonation. Right? Now, the point is, will you fail to understand me or will you understand me? I think you'll understand quite well. And I put the one tone I'm using right at the beginning, it's that tone, the high level tone, and I stay on it practically all the way. Poor unfortunate monks and nuns in their holy monasteries and convents must inevitably get so terribly bored with chanting or singing the whole of the time at just one and the same single pitch level that most usually if only at the very end of whatever it is they are singing they finish by managing to incorporate into it briefly at least a very slight change of pitch. <laughs> Look at your uh, copy of the, uh, <coughs> the demonstrations. Now my second demonstration is uh, I'm going to use only one single vowel point. Right? Now you know there are in English uh, quite a lot of vowels. We count that we've got 20 uh, simple uh, vowels. Um, we've got uh, 12 simple vowels here, and we've got 8 different ones. Well, I'm going to uh, read to you now something that only uses one vowel quality. Now, that vowel quality is stronger in a way that is the only pair of phonemes in English that are distinguished solely by length, right? All the others have length and some other feature, but length is the only thing that keeps apart er uh and er, uh, right? They are made with exactly the same tongue position. So here we go. Then let's see what this sounds like. 